to move straight on. I think Mr Rowley, you're ready. The next item of business is a debate on motion S5M14717 in the name of Alec Rowley on investing in social care for Scotland's future. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak once now? And I call on Alec Rowley to speak to and move the motion. Mr Rowley, eight minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Labour has brought forward this motion for debate today in order to highlight what we see as some of the challenging challenges being faced by providers of health and social care. We have always been supportive of the integration of health and social care services and the setting up of the joint integration boards, whilst being clear that community care must never be seen as care on the cheap and therefore must be funded to ensure the highest level of quality and support to meet individuals' needs. Age Scotland state that a lack of social care has a direct impact on other vital services such as the NHS. In September 2018, figures show that four in ten people who were ready to leave hospital waited more than a month to do so. That's too many older people at risk of losing their mobility and independence, putting their health and well-being at risk. Is Scotland go on to say that the Scottish Government must urgently take action to reduce this and ensure that health and social care is adequately funded for every older person who needs it. The Labour leader of COSLA, Councillor David Ross of Fife Council, has called on the Government to recognise the key role that social care plays in the health system and bring forward additional funding to support this. He states, and I quote, if spending on the NHS continues to be protected, then so should social care spending. And he continues, expecting the NHS to transfer adequate funding into social care from acute lacks transparency and is unrealistic. He goes on, there is a concern that in the past additional funding for social care has been channelled through the NHS and some of this has been creamed off before reaching social care services. Therefore, I would suggest that there needs to be clearer transparency around funding for health and social care. Yeah, I'm, Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Rowley for taking the intervention. I'm sure he'll recognise that I have heard very similar comments from the health service about local government. And that is why, for example, it is really important that the jointly uh, run review currently going on between COSLA and ourselves uh, onto how well we've progressed so far on integration includes in it strands around governance and finance precisely to address those issues. So we know exactly what's going on and not just what one group of people says versus what another group of people say. Alec Rowley. Well, another way of, of, of doing that, we would suggest, would be to look at the Scottish Government directly funding the IGBs. But another main point in our motion is that there needs to be discussion between the key partners around a financial model that will provide long-term stability for both health and social care in Scotland. I think the Cabinet Secretary makes a point herself where she says they're blaming each other. Why not direct the funding directly from the Scottish Government into the IGBs and then we will have clear transparency? The reality is that moving resources from health to social care is proven challenging and progress is not fast enough. Realistically, shifting the balance of care will require investment in social care services if real improvements are to be made. SCVO also raised an important issue around the commissioning of social care services and point out that the sustainability issues are coming up to the fore due to factors such as the low early rates and the lack of resources. We have to realise that driving down the cost of social care is in the main achieved by driving down the pay and conditions of care workers. My experience and my personal experience uh, of home care was when my dad was ill before he died. He had a full care package which was four times a day visits and as we got to speak with the carers we discovered that two of the visits were from carers employed by the council and two were, visits were from carers employed by an agency. All the carers 
were brilliant and we could never repay the amazing care and support that they provided to my dad. But the only difference, therefore, at the end of the day, was that some were paid a lot less than others, had poorer terms and condition than others, and did not have the same job security as others. Surely that cannot be right. Surely we should be promoting a more sustainable model of care, one that aims to get the maximum social value from public funds. This should include more in-house provisions so that the public funding for care is not being used to drive the profits of large-scale commercial providers. Where contracting is currently still necessary, more efforts should be made to break contracts up into smaller units. This gives locally based providers a meaningful chance of bidding for that work rather than large commercial chains that are increasingly financially unstable. In a survey of care workers by Unison, I'm sorry, I've not got time to, to do this. In a survey of care workers by Unison, almost half of carers said they were limited to specific times with clients. One and two workers are not reimbursed for travelling between client visits, while three and four said they expected the situation to get much worse in the coming year. They also revealed that one in ten were on zero hours contracts. I don't know how many members read the briefing that came in from Enable Scotland, but I thought they made a very important point about the treatment of social care workers when they said, and I quote, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation reported in 2016 that 15% of social care workers are in work poverty. This means that we have Scotland's most vulnerable people being cared by Scotland's most vulnerable workforce. Now, the introduction of the living wage was meant to improve that, but I would ask the government to look at some of the claims that are being made that some organisations are still not paying the living wage and therefore carers are still being paid poverty wages. However, I would go further and point out that most politicians here in this parliament were queuing up to offer their support to mostly women who in Glasgow went on strike quite rightly for equal pay a few weeks ago. But that begs the question, should we not be supporting equal pay for all workers in the care sector? Poor pay, poor terms and conditions leads to higher turnover, increased recruitment and training challenges, and there's a false economy. We know that caring for people in their own home, or if indeed they need it, in a care home is far less costly than a hospital. So why would we not spend the money that is needed to build a high quality social care sector, which pays well, employs local people, and puts care at the forefront of its activities? That requires a significant shift in thinking from where we are right now, and that is what Labour is calling for. We will work with the government if the government are willing to make that radical transformation in social care. I would finish uh, by saying to the Cabinet Secretary, right across Scotland, local authorities are reporting that there are massive overspends in the IGBs. We do have a problem. We want to work with you on that, but we have to face the reality of the situation out there right now. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Please move, I move the motion. motion. Thank you. I now call Jean Freeman, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and move Amendment 14717.36 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, in this role, I have the privilege uh, to meet with people who both benefit from and provide social care. And while those I've met and heard from have been resoundingly positive about many aspects of the service they receive or the work that they do, it is not the universal experience. So I welcome this opportunity to have this debate in this parliament, to hear what members have to say, and I'm grateful to Mr Rowley for the motion that he has brought. I know that we need to continue to make improvements, but I also know that that doesn't sit with government alone but with the partnerships we have and we nurture with local authorities, with the NHS, with integrated joint boards to harness our collective experience and efforts and to make the improvements where they are needed. In the health and social care financial framework that I brought before this chamber in October, we recognised 
that services needed to change, particularly as we enjoy longer lives, but with more complex needs. A key component of that change is the delivery of integration in health and social care. Integration is the most significant reform to health and social care services since the NHS was created in 1948. But integration is not an end in and of itself. It is a tool, a means through which we collectively deliver better services for people. Because people don't and shouldn't have to care about whose budget the service or the support they need comes from. They want our collective focus and our work to be driven by their need as a whole person. They want the support they need to be safe and effective, the right support in the right place and at the right time. Integration brings together almost £9 billion, which was previously managed separately in health boards and councils. And this year, it includes more than £550 million of NHS frontline investment to support integration and social care. So this is a whole system approach that needs to be focused on safe, effective and crucially person-centred services. And it needs whole system thinking. So in that regard, I am as one with Mr Rowley in uh, emphasising the importance of us to look at the system as a whole and to think about the system as a whole. That is radically different and it is challenging. To deliver the significant shift we need in thinking and delivery as fully as it is needed will, of course, take time. But we do that together. So with COSLA, we are right now reviewing how far we have come, identifying where we are getting it right, working out what we need to do to scale up the good practice that does exist, and crucially, what more we need to do to learn and apply lessons and continue to build the momentum of improvement. With COSLA, we are committed to the delivery and upcoming expansion of free personal care. Scotland continues to be the only country in the UK which provides free personal care. 76,000 people over the age of 65 currently receive that in Scotland and from April this next year, free personal care will be extended to those under 65. The social care workforce provide care to people the length and breadth of our country. We want to help them develop which is why we have provided funding for adult social care workers, all adult social care workers, to be paid the real living wage. That has benefited up to 40,000 care workers. And like Mr Rowley, I have heard and have correspondence from individuals and organisations who are adult social care workers who have yet to benefit from that funding that this government provided. That problem is a shared problem between ourselves and COSLA and with COSLA we need to look at why those funds are not being passed on to deliver that commitment I am sure shared across this chamber but fixing that does not lie at the hands of government alone. I am sure that, that members, if you give me a sec, I am sure that members would be quick to criticise this government if we got into the business of instructing local authorities what they were to do. Yes. Elaine Smith. Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. And I wonder, has the Cabinet Secretary read the Enable briefing, which says third sector providers like Enable Scotland are forced to either fund uplifts in staff pay from reserves or other revenue streams, or tell our staff that we are simply unable to pay the Scottish living wage for every hour worked? How would the Cabinet Secretary respond to that? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful for the question and I have read the briefing. I've heard, read all of the briefings that have come in for today's debate as, as I properly should. And my response to Enable, who I expect to meet very shortly along with Send Scotland, is this is in the nature of the contract you have with the local authority. So you need to take that up with the local authority because the, we provide the funds, the contracts are between the local authorities and the providers. Now, if, if Labour want us to take those contracts and be responsible as Scottish Government, I wonder if they've had those conversations with COSLA to take those powers away from local authorities. But if that's what you want, I'll have the discussion. What I will do, what I will do, is that I will work with Enable and Send Scotland and any other organisation who have not received through the contract 
part of which we have funded to ensure there is the real living wage paid. If they have not had that, then I will take that up on their behalf alongside them with the local authority. And I would urge the member and all members here to do precisely that as well. Mm -hmm. Now, we will publish an integrated health and social care workforce plan for Scotland in the near future. As part of the development of that plan, we have published specific recommendations that cover the social care workforce. These directly address recruitment challenges, promote career pathways, and improve workforce development and social care. And that plan, as with others, has been developed alongside our colleagues in local authorities and the third sector, and indeed in some instances in private sector providers and third, force, uh, third sector providers too. But as we look at our workforce, who I'm they afraid, are, I'm afraid, how to value, to you really must conclude there. I, I'm terribly sorry. It's a short debate, so I'm afraid uh -huh. you must conclude. And I took two interventions. Uh, but yes, there but you go. even even with that, you've had another nearly another minute. Could you please move your amendment? Sorry about that. I move the amendment. Thank you. Um, these short debates are always awkward for the chair. Uh, can I call on Miles Briggs to speak to move amendment 1417.1? Deputy President Officer, I'm pleased to take part in today's debate and thank the Labour Party uh, for bringing forward this important debate because social care is one of the most important issues our country faces and is of great concern to so many older and vulnerable people and their families and friends across our country. And I'd like to also pay tribute and thank the organisations who have provided useful briefings for today's debate, including SCVO, Enable and Age Scotland. The SNP government and this First Minister have said repeatedly that they will get on top of delayed discharge crisis in Scotland, which is clearly one of the clearest indicators of the pressures on social care networks across our country. Indeed, the former Health Secretary Shona Robson promised three years ago that this government would eradicate the problem today. But the re reality is, as shown by the most recent ISD figures, that the problem is deteriorating and this government shows no signs of knowing how to turn the situation round. The most recent figures show 1,529 people in September were forced to stay in hospital despite being fit to leave, mostly because of an inability to arrange appropriate at-home care packages, but also a lack of suitable care home places. And this is a worsening figure, and this has got worse over the last two years. Perhaps most concerning was the recent case highlighted in the Sunday Times newspaper of delayed discharges of individuals of up to four and seven years at some health boards across Scotland. With a patient deemed fit for discharge by a Scottish Health Board in 2011, still under NHS care, according to the Mental Health uh, Welfare Commission for Scotland. I recently also met with MND Scotland, who highlighted to me a number of individual cases across Scotland, who due to their failure in community social care, ended up admitted to hospital, and then often saw their condition significantly deteriorate. As my amendment points out today, for today's debate, it highlights the real need for a joint working between housing associations to ensure that delays in making necessary home adaptations do not further contribute to delays in being able to get people out of hospital. Deputy President Officer, the delayed discharge crisis is particular, particularly acute here in my own Lothian region, with delayed discharge rates higher here than in any other part of Scotland, and accounting now for almost a quarter of all of Scotland's delayed discharge. Edinburgh City has more delayed discharges than any other council in Scotland. And I'd like to commend newspapers like the Edinburgh Evening News for their ongoing care in crisis campaign, which is helping to keep the pressure on the city's health and social care partnership. Not a week goes by that I do not receive uh, correspondence from constituents and families who come to ask for help because of the clear breakdown in our social care system here in the capital and these situations and cases not being able to be resolved. And the inability of local health and social care partnerships to provide sustainable care packages is in large part due to the recruitment crisis within the social care sector today. Edinburgh's Health and Social Care Partnership has said that local contracted providers have reported high turnover rates of staff in the region of 30 to 50 per cent. Yeah, very I briefly. warn the member, there's no time in hand. You have to absorb it. Mm. Cabinet yep. Secretary. So very, very quickly, will the member recognise that in Edinburgh there is a particular pressure in terms of the labour market, which is why both the local authority and NHS Lothian have jointly contributed additional funds to meet that? 
Miles Briggs. Absolutely, and I have been calling for that for two years and met with the Health Board to, to say that needs to be put in place. We have an overheated market here in Edinburgh, which is contributing to that factor. But I agree with what Alex Rowley said specifically, and I think it's important that our social care workers and the need for us to support them and value them is also really recognised and encouraged in that they are fulfilling a vital role and should be held in the same regard as clinical and other NHS work workers. While investment in extra childcare is, of course, welcome, the impact this is going to have on the adult and, and elderly care workforce and the additional staff we need may also be something the government needs to be in incredibly aware of as well. And the Scottish the government will need to address these concerns without delay and look to how we make these social care workforce plans be brought forward quicker. The Parliament's Health and Sport Committee, for example, undertook an inquiry into social care workforce and made an important number of recommendations which to date we've not seen a progress in implementing and some of those were highlighted uh, by Alec Rowley. A national social care inter, inter, in, internship programme, for example, I think merits consideration and could be a good opportunity to give students studying relevant courses practical experience in the field. And I hope that's something the Scottish Government will ex agree to explore. Such a scheme um, can be taken forward by colleges, universities and social care providers. And I think it's important to meet what is now a real demand of additional staff across Scotland for the social care workforce. The Parliament's Health and Sport Committee in its recent report also looked ahead to this year's budget expressing serious concerns about the leadership in some of our local health and social care partnerships and the fact that too many partnerships are failing to deliver the transformational change required. And, and then I'm afraid you must conclude. I have um, to be just the same with everyone. I'm sorry about uh, that. No, minutes. you must conclude. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yeah. No, you've got five um, minutes. So to, to conclude, Deputy You're President five minutes. Officer. Sorry, Mr Scotland. Briggs, it's five minutes. You must sit down. I have no time in hand. Uh, uh, please move your amendment. Uh, I move my amendment, Sorry. my name. I call Alison Johnson. I type four minutes, please. Um, thank you, presiding officer. I thank Labour for bringing this debate to the chamber this afternoon, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss the future of social care in Scotland. I'm heartened by the progress that has been made in making personal care and nursing care free to all who need it, regardless of age or condition. It was deeply unfair that free care was limited by age, and I believe this change was won because the government listened to voices across parties, constituencies and communities. I think we all understand how integral high-quality social care is to our entire health and social care system, and how this should be reflected in housing and in our fair work practices too. So I hope this afternoon allows us to make further progress in agreeing shared priorities for social care. Of course, no discussion of, of care should fail to recognise the incredible contribution unpaid carers make. Health and social care budgets are stretched. We can only imagine how much worse the, this would be without, the, without their incredible contribution, that incredible contribution of unpaid carers. A contribution we should better recognise through a more generous and more widely available Scottish carers assistance. But returning to pay, I wholeheartedly agree with the point made in Labour's motion that there is still a disparity between the value of social care to society and staff's level of pay and working conditions. Investment the Scottish Government has made in the living wage for social care workers has been welcome. Clearly there are problems and not all workers are receiving that yet. We can and mustn't stop there. The Scottish Greens have long called for a living wage plus for social care staff. A rate of £10 per hour for social care staff would reflect how important their work is to our communities and public services. That's £10 per hour at least, showing the high regard we have for this specialised caring role. Such investment would be a significant boost to women's pay, given that around 85% of social services workforce are women. And I'd also like to see the Scottish Government committing specific resources towards delivering meaningful pay differentials among staff building careers in this sector. This kind of direct support would encourage staff to develop into specialised senior and management roles with increased responsibility and would help address the serious staff shortages in the sector and the high turnover within it. Scottish Care indicate the average turnover figure in care homes is 22%. As Age Scotland point out, this is only likely to be further compounded by Brexit. At least 6% of our social care staff are likely to be EEA nationals, as are around 8% of nurses in the sector. And with more EU nurses leaving than joining the Nursery and Midwifery Council's UK register, enough damage has been done already. 
the BMA and the RCN are campaigning for a people's vote. And reflecting on Labour's motion on social care today, I would urge my colleagues on those benches to join them. To ensure that social care services are sustainable in the future, an increase in resources is necessary, as well as efforts to safeguard existing staffing levels in the face of Brexit and improve workforce planning. But there doesn't yet seem to be a very strong consensus as to how increased resources should be directed to frontline social care services. Um, the motion calls for a financial model developed in partnership, I think, to address this issue. And it is fair to recognise, of course, that the government have work ongoing in this regard since Audit Scotland have welcomed the medium-term financial framework for health and social care. Um, I, Greens will support the Labour motion today, but I would point out that the Fraser of Allender's uh, Allender Institute's budget report also stresses, and I quote, spending choices shouldn't just be viewed as a trade-off between local government and health. Um, when the aim of integration is for spending on health and social care to support each other, we must move away from considering one budget protected at the expense of another. Um, both need to be properly funded. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Willie Reddy, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Half a million bed days are lost to the NHS every year because of delayed discharge. This was supposed to be an issue that was resolved coming up for three years now because the previous health secretary had given that commitment. Now, I'm not pretending this is an easy problem to solve, but it does show the, the difference between the rhetoric of three years ago and the reality of today. And my concern about the integrated authorities is that we've not created integration. We've created a separate third body that is actually junior to both the council and the NHS bodies within each area. And when there's difficulty, those two bodies are nowhere to be seen. And that is one of the challenges we've got. We've not created that integrated body that we need. The, the high turnover of leadership within integrated authorities is of grave concern. Seven, within the, seven out of the 31 authorities have had new chief officers within the last two years. The lack of long-term financial planning, the lack of data sharing, and we know the problems of the different languages that the different professionals in each half of the organisation speak. The lack of collaboration between the bodies, the confused accountability. And all of that has led to this half a million bed days lost to the NHS every year. It does indicate the health of a hospital because it is the flow through the hospital as the number of bed, day, bed days indicates. As much as the A&E waiting times are important, this is probably a greater indicator about how well a hospital is performing. And that's why it's really important we get on top of these particular problems. If I am allowed to give some quick examples in Fife of where I think this isn't working, we've got a proposal to close the GP out of hours facility in St Andrews, a responsibility of the integrated authority. The NHS in Fife have distanced themselves from this decision. The council tell me that the individual councillors on the integrated joint board are there in their own right, not as on behalf of the council. Now, if this is an integrated body, a joint body, both should be responsible for the decisions of the integrated joint board, but both are distancing themselves. Even though the co-leader, I won't say which party, voted for the proposal to close the St Andrews facility, even though he's in the leadership of Fife Council that's supposed to be part of this integrated body. The whole thing is a shambles, and that's why people in Fife are very confused about actually who is responsible for any of this. The turbulent leadership is also an example in Fife. Um, Michael Kellett, who's a, a very good officer, um, the chief officer is relatively new within the organisation, and we've just lost Simon Little, who is the immediate past chair, um, from uh, the body, prematurely removed from the board. Again, removing continuity that I think uh, we need. It's part of the wider concerns that I have raised about the performance of NHS Fife and its leadership, with four departures from the senior positions within the body within the last few years, and it's something I hope that the Scottish Government Commission an investigation into. But the other fundamental weaknesses that we've got within the integrated authorities are quite fundamental to the whole organisation. The shortage of workers, particularly in rural areas, where workers aren't paid to travel between homes to care for individuals. No wonder we're finding it difficult to get carers to cover rural homes and rural patients. 
And then Brexit, of course, is compounding the problem as well, which is why we do need that people's vote that Alison Johnson was talking about. Robert Kilgour has talked about the impact of Brexit in this perfect storm, a combination of different issues impacting on the care set service. But finally, the removal by Beald of 12 of its care homes surely is another indicator that this sector has serious problems. Thank you. We move to the open debate. We're already behind time, so uh, under four minutes would be useful. Elaine Smith, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you very much, President Officer. On many occasions in this Parliament, members have commended the skills and the professionalism of those working in the social care sector, and rightly so, because for so many families across Scotland, a good quality of life and engagement with the wider community is entirely dependent on the support of social care services. Investing in the social care sector also contributes to the preventative spend agenda by keeping people healthier and active in their own home and, as we've heard in other speeches, releasing hospital beds for those who need them most. Social care sector workers, mostly women, make a significant contribution to the local economy, earning and spending in our communities. There will, I'm sure, be agreement across the Chamber that this essential work should be valued accordingly. As such, the targets set on the payment of the living wage across the sector are to be welcomed and the progress made has improved the earnings, I'm sure, of many households. However, too many of the children who are living in poverty in Scotland are living in households where at least one and often two adults are in work. So we should be asking if simply delivering on the living wage alone is adequate for meeting the needs of families or indeed in this instance recognises the value of the social care sector. Implementation costs for the payment of the living wage as a minimum across the sector appear to be unclear. Last week, the Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland commented in two recent research reports. In surveying the experience of their own membership, providers have in the main kept up with living wage increases. But the reality is that um, less than a third of the organisations secured sufficient funding from living wage earmarked sources to cover the costs. This must mean that other aspects of the service suffer. Staff recruitment and retention is known to be a problem already. If overall staffing capacity has to be reduced, then the, there is more pressure on existing staff to do the work. Sickness and absence levels increase and job satisfaction decreases. This really is no way to run a service on which so many of our citizens depend. The recent Strathclyde University research also looked at the experiences of those involved in delivering uh, the payment of the living wage across the sector. Whilst recognising some of the progress made, the research report highlights almost 32 different approaches to implementation across our local authorities, with time and resources wasted and undue strain placed on some organisations and departments. Looking to the future, the social care sector, including the voluntary sector providers who work in partnership with the local authorities, need the financial support to bring in new staff. This means younger staff, a more diverse workforce, staff who may also be starting or bringing up a family, staff who need well-funded maternity and paternity leave, sick pay, pension rights and good terms of employment, meeting the aspirations of the Fair Work Framework set out by the government. Annie Gunnar Logan, CCPS director, said the findings outlined in these reports suggest that the delivery of the living wage in social care has, a, has made a practical reality, at least in part, by a significant transfer of financial responsibility and risk to the voluntary sector, with con con concomitant pressure say that word, on the sector to bail out the policy with a pretty whopping level of subsidy. The First Minister has made a commitment to extend fair work, including the living wage, to as many funding streams as possible through public procurement. We warmly welcome that commitment and want to see it happen as soon as possible. But this new research shows clearly that the implementation process needs a complete overhaul if this policy is to have a positive, lasting legacy. Both of these reports raise serious questions about a longer-term commitment to improving paying conditions across the sector, and our social care workers deserve far better. The Scottish Government presiding officer must indicate how it intends to address these specific concerns and take seriously uh, the need for more investment in this key employment sector in Scotland. Emma Harper, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. The motion today, investing in social care in Scotland's future, states that the health and social care system is based on human rights, where people receive care according to their need and not their ability to pay. President officer, I absolutely agree with this statement. A key priority for the Scottish Government is ensuring that the needs of people who are experiencing care comes first and that their rights and choices are respected. 
I, like many in the chamber, recognise the immediate and long-term challenges to the delivery of care in people's homes and indeed in the community. I also recognise that there are challenges to demonstrating and elevating the, the, the value of people who chose to look after those who need care. And in preparation for this debate today, I was reminded of my nurse training, and I remind Chamber that I'm a registered nurse. And when I started my training, I learned about Abraham, Abraham Maslow and his theory of the hierarchy of psychological health needs. And his paper, published way back in 1943, is still relevant today. His hierarchy of needs described basic needs of survival, food and water, shelter, warmth and safety. Carers provide a level of support and care that achieves the basic needs that human beings require. And often, while engaging in their care duties, they support clients and service users in many ways. Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs is as relevant today as it was in 1943. And I do agree that attracting and retaining the right people to become carers and raising the status of social care as a profession is key to delivering quality care. Presiding officer, the SNP government has taken action to protect our social care services. It has taken action to ensure that adult social care workers are paid the living wage. This move has benefited up to 40,000 carers, many of whom are women, which Elaine Smith has already highlighted as well. I'm sorry, I'm not taking an intervention because time is tight. In addition, the SNP Scottish Government has ensured that this year there will be more than £550 million of NHS frontline investment in social care and integration. And around £66 million of this £550 million will enable local government to better support social care, including the continued delivery of the living wage for adult care workers, and it will cover the extension of sleepover hours during 2018-19. Ensuring that the workforce is properly trained, supported and regulated is key to effective, safe and high quality deliver of, delivery of services. And this is exactly what the Scottish Government is doing and, and what it will continue to do. Moving and handling is one of the key skills required by both paid and unpaid carers to prevent injury. And I have had representations from a constituent in Ayr who has asked me to pick this up and I've already written to the Cabinet Secretary on this matter. And I support the government's amendment, which includes the addition of increased resources and investment into primary care. Presiding officer, in my South Scotland region, there is currently a very active programme working with local people across the rural South West Scotland called Transform in Wigtonshire. And I've spoken about Transform in Wigtonshire previously and its goal to generate ideas and different ways of working so that social care resources can be delivered in the most effective way. The programme is underway and European Union funding has been applied for and is available to investigate how implementing technology can be used to support people in their homes so that people can remain independent and supported and get out of hospital quicker. This technology called Empower and CoSync and now Attend Anywhere is being piloted and tested in the area and I look forward to seeing the outcomes as they become available. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I support the Scottish Government's motion and I agree that social care must absolutely be a fundamental right and those working in the sector must be recognised and paid the fair wage. Thank you. Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, the concept of integrating health and social care has unanimous support from across the spectrum of politics and professions. It is the ultimate no-brainer, a policy that would not only deliver a better care system for the over 65s, enabling people to stay in their own homes and communities, a policy that reduces the use of acute health services and improves everyone's quality of life, a policy that ultimately would help address the challenges of our increasing longevity, and a policy that while improving lives would deliver a more financially sustainable outlook. That view hasn't changed, and the support for Frank's law reinforced the belief that the provision of free personal care for those that need it is an important social principle. However, despite this unanimous support, the delivery of the principle is still facing a number of hurdles, not least of all the conflicting interests of local government and the health service. In the early days, it was a battle of language and understanding between two different cultures. Today, it is more a battle of resources and control. In 2011, the Christie Commission into the Future Delivery of Public Services identified, in my view, five key issues. That services were provided to individuals rather than designed for and with them. 
that models of provision had failed to empower and enable people and communities sufficiently to achieve positive outcomes in their own lives, that services had often impaired individual incentives and fostered dependencies that created demand, whilst a culture of professional dominance in public bodies had made them unresponsive to changing needs and risk-averse about innovation. And finally, procurement was often taken forward on a scale that discriminated against smaller providers and person-centred approaches. So I guess the question is, how far have we really gone in addressing those challenges? I believe there is a real tension between the key partners. The health service needs patients to be able to leave acute care in a timely manner. Delaying discharge is not only an expensive option, it is also a poor option for the patient, particularly the elderly, as people can become institutionalised, losing their independence through reduced movement and risk of infection. Local government, on the other hand, are feeling the strain on their budgets and seeking solutions to the increased pressure to provide more services to a burgeoning elderly population. I do not believe that the competing interests of these two bodies, no matter how united their press releases, serves the best approach to meeting people's needs. There is a clear lack of leadership as integrated joint board members have half an eye to the interests of the bodies from which they are appointed to the IJB. I say this not to be disparaging of the members of the IJB, but in recognition that this is a difficult balance to get right. The reality on the ground is that people just want good services. They don't care who is in charge, but somebody needs to be. Delivery of a high quality social care system requires motivated caring staff Pay certainly has a role in that, but so do conditions of work and, most important, job satisfaction. Many elderly people develop very positive caring relationships with those that come in to assist them, but there are difficulties. When I speak to care staff, one of the consistent concerns they raise is the lack of time they have to deliver the care they would like to. The 15 minutes often allocated is not long enough to support some people effectively. Both the client and the carer struggle with this and it fails the person-centred care test. We do need transformational change and I'm not suggesting that there is not good work being done on the ground and I certainly welcome the independent inquiry that is now underway. But as yet, integration of health and social care is still very much a work in progress. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Jackie Bailey, followed by Fulton McGregor. Presiding Officer, there are two specific issues I want to cover in the short time available. Both relate to the importance of the social care workforce, and we know that the quality of social care is fundamentally about resources, and the biggest resource of all is indeed the workforce. Without that dedicated workforce, the system would simply collapse. Now, we know the challenges of recruitment and retention in social care. There is no doubt in my mind that this will be exacerbated by Brexit, but there is much that we can do. It is a growing sector. The need for social care is increasing, whether you're someone with a learning disability needing support or an older person requiring a nighttime tuck-in service, the care provided is essential to your well-being. Now, for the very first time in the Scottish Parliament's history, social care was recognised by the Economy Committee as a key growth sector that mattered fundamentally to our economy. The committee recommended that it should be treated as such by Scottish Enterprise, but unfortunately, ministers thought otherwise. I would ask them to think again. Caring and the jobs in that sector make a hugely important contribution to the Scottish economy. It's a predominantly feminised workforce, characterised by low wages and part-time temporary work. That needs to change, and we need to value the service that they provide as a society. And one obvious way of doing so is through their pay packet. Now, the Scottish Government allocated additional money for local government to pay the living wage from October 2016 for waking hours, something that Scottish Labour campaigned for, and I welcome very much. During the passage of the Procurement Bill, the SNP refused our calls to pay the living wage for all employees on public contracts, but I am glad that they've changed their minds and done so for social care staff. I welcome, too, the announcement by Shona Robson in October 2017 that the living wage would apply to staff providing nighttime cover as well. This was to be implemented this year, in 2018-19. Additional funds were given by the Scottish Government to health and social care partnerships to do this. 
So the living wage would be in place for all staff, whether daytime or nighttime cover, not just for those employed directly by the local authority, but those employed in the private and voluntary sectors too. But the reality on the ground cabinet secretary is very different, and we've heard that from speakers today. Let me tell you about the experience of one of the largest third sector providers of social care. They're keen to pay their staff the living wage for sleepovers. So too are their trade unions. But the delivery of the policy on the ground is patchy. Services commissioned by local authorities for the full year have been commissioned already without payment of the living wage for sleepovers. In fact, some 60% of local authorities who commission care services have not provided the living wage for sleepovers for the entirety of 2018-19. I cannot believe that the Cabinet Secretary would be content with that. Money has been given to pay the living wage, money which is not ending up in the pockets of hard-working care staff, where I know she wants it to be. We all want it to be there, and I cannot believe the Cabinet Secretary is happy that it's not. So will she ensure, and will help her, that for the remainder of this year, that the money is paid so staff get their rightful pay? Will she give a guarantee now that the policy will be fully funded for 2019-20, and that all staff, all staff doing sleepovers will be paid the living wage? Presiding officer, I know you'll want to know that it's 41 days away from Christmas. The panto season is upon us. Will Jean Freeman be Santa? or Scrooge. Social care workers are watching with interest, and I hope she's Santa. Wilton McGregor, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, money has been invested in NHS social care integration. Health spending per head is 71-point percent higher than the UK as a whole, and that's 850 million more spending in health services in Scotland. And given that Labour have brought this debate to the Chamber, it's worth remembering the Labour spending plans from the last Scottish election for health would see an NHS cut by 360 million. Worse off, that's equivalent to 9,000 nurses. And rather than deliver the full uh, funding, the UK government have cut our budget by almost 55 million next year and over 270 million over their five-year plan. But despite those UK government cuts to Scotland's budget, an additional 66 million will be provided to local government to support the Carers Scotland Act. And I hope this will be welcomed by everyone. Because, President Officer, first and foremost, the Scottish Government's priority is to ensure the needs of people experiencing care come first and that their rights and choices are respected. And within the past decade, a significant amount of work and investment has gone into supporting older people and people with disabilities to live well in their homes for longer. As a population, we are living longer, meaning that demand for support care and support is growing faster than our traditional services we are designed for. The challenge looking after our ageing population in the future is one that we all must face head on. And Scotland is the only part of the UK, as others that have mentioned, to have implemented free personal care for older people and will be the only part to implement it for people under 65. All in all, we have a system that, although it's not perfect, is much fairer. In general, there has been cross-party political consensus on the, the issue of integration and given the importance of this issue, that's right. And this is the second time in a week that I've spoken on this issue after contributing to Monica Lennon's members debate uh, last week, a debate used to criticise decisions of an SNP council to reduce the need for care homes and support independent living, living decisions, which I pointed out at the time were actually initiated under the Labour administration, and quite rightly too. And what M Monica Lennon in that debate and her colleagues failed to address is the fact that neighbouring North Lanarkshire Council, uh, un which is under Labour, are now down, down to just one care home. But I agree I'm not going to be a hypocrite on this, presiding officer. I agree that's a sign that we're supporting people more to live at home. I'm not going to get any time for intervention, sorry. The worker situation is a, is a theme where, in that debate and this debate, where I would find some common ground with Monica Lennon and Alex Rowley uh, mentioned it today, as have other speakers. And we must work with the social uh, care workforce to find the right employment for everyone I can. That's why this SNP government has provided funding to enable adult social care workers are paid the Scottish living wage. And it was the living wage week uh, just last week. And this has benefited up to 40,000 care workers, as Emma Harper pointed out. Um, and average earnings of adult social care workers are higher in Scotland than elsewhere in the UK. But I think this point's been talked about a lot. In the short time, I just want to welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary's remarks earlier that she's willing to address some of the concerns that have been raised um, 
in the chamber today about, about people being paid the living wage when they're employed through third sector organisations. But of course, presiding officer, um, in terms of the system that we've got, it's not perfect. Uh, and no one, and no one's denying that. It's a system that cares for some of our most vulnerable people and needs to be flexible and responsive. And like every MSP in here, I'm sure that we've all had queries from people unhappy about the level of care received from themselves or from relatives, or they're unhappy about localised decisions, such as, for example, reduction in community alarms or reduction to gardening services and their knock-on effects in personal care. As politicians, uh, at all levels of government, we, we must respond honestly to these issues and learn from them to make the system as effective as we can. And I, and I have to mention unpaid carers as well, like Alison Johnson, the work that they do, um, absolutely fantastic. Presiding officer, we, we need to work collaboratively on, on this. As, uh, it's one of the, the, the biggest challenges of our generation. Thank you. Uh, brevity and the final two open debate speakers be appreciated. Alexander Stewart, followed by Alec Neil. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The decision to integrate health and social care and to see the shift of balance of care out of hospitals into community was fundamentally the right one. Finding we are putting these ambitions into practice has, however, been something of a challenge. Having seen uh, firsthand as a councillor that the integrated joint boards, when they were first set up, uh, and I was acutely aware that councillors and NHS board members and officers from organisations took some time to adapt to the new way of working. And indeed, uh, they must continue to adapt to this new way of working if they are to make progress within social care. At present, the increasing costs that are brought about by the pressures of an ageing population are outpacing the rate of transmissional care uh, made in the integrated authorities. And in a recent report from the Health and Sports Committee of this parliament, it suggested that this was due to a lack of leadership within them. Now, that's a real problem uh, and a problem that has to be tackled if we have a leadership issue. The report also highlighted concerns that some senior managers were directly linked to one of the partners and therefore might have a conflict of interest when budget decisions were being made. More concerning, however, was the lack of joint working arrangements between NHS boards and local authorities, which also allowed one manager to have responsibilities for staff in both organisations. While often teams of staff are, and partners work together without such formal arrangements, true integration will continue to elude us if we don't tackle that problem. Deputy Presiding Officer, there are still concerns about integrated joint boards' ability to govern and the arrangements that they have when it comes to governance. While the integrated scheme may allow for things like overshares and, share, and a share of overspend between partnering organisations, it is not necessarily a requirement for that to mean, and local authorities might have to pick up the bill for significant increases in demand pressures that will then particularly take place. The amount of budget that's made to very careful, and that's very important that we look at how that budget is managed, because we have to ensure that we're not going to have two authorities that have failed and just replacing that with three that might be failing also. We have also seen the need to ensure that mo a move to improve delays discharge, including through the improved sharing of information. In my own region and uh, in, in the Council of Perth and Kinross, the Home Assessment Recovery Team seeks to get people out of hospital and back into their own homes as soon as practically possible by putting in place the necessary adaptations. It also provides temporary care to help them readjust to being back in their home before they get the permanent package of care they require. This model has been very successful in reducing the number of delays discharged and is one that could be replicated across other areas. All of these considerations are rather academic, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, if we are unable to get the staff to provide the services that are required. The Care Inspectorate recently indicated that 35% of care services in 2015-16 had been unfilled due to staff vacancies and the Scottish Care talked about the, the proportion of homes uh, that required full-time nursing posts uh, that had increased of recently. So we need to look at ways that these jobs become more attractive to those who might otherwise be put off by not working in the sector or working in another sector. So, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, we have made some real progress along the road to real health and social integration, but there is still much work to be done. We should continue to monitor the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act is being implemented and consider how we in the Scottish Parliament can support the development of integrating authorities. If this is achieved, it will go a long way to tackling the many issues within the sector. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Stewart. The last speaker in the open debate is Alex Neil. 
day, Deputy <coughs> Presiding Officer. Can I just, first of all, uh, emphasise the fact that we have made significant progress in recent years. Uh, I particularly welcome the introduction of Frank's Law, the introduction of the living wage, and also the increase in the carer's allowance, all of which are making a substantive contribution to the improvement of social care. But we all know there are major challenges still to be faced. Uh, but it's worthwhile reminding ourselves, why is it this is so important? It's very important for the following reason. And that is that the policy of integration is driven by the medical and economic evidence. And the medical evidence is that patients are better treated and safer treated at home, if they can be, than being treated in a hospital setting. And at any one time, and I remember the statistic, I got it in day one when I became the Cabinet Secretary for Health. At any one time in Scotland, or indeed in any advanced economy, there's about one third of the patients in hospital who ideally don't need to be there. And it's not to their medical advantage to be there. That is why we've got to transfer and get those people treated in the community rather than in hospital, as they've done very successfully, most successfully in Alaska. But there's a very unusual situation here because not only is treatment at home medically the best way to treat patients, it's actually also the least expensive. Usually in the health service, the best treatment is the most expensive treatment but ironically here, it's also the least expensive. It costs nearly, on average, four and a half thousand pounds a week to keep somebody in an acute hospital. It costs about two thousand pounds a week to keep them in a community hospital. Seven hundred pounds a week in a nursing home and three to four hundred pounds a week at home. So there's both a medical and a resource issue that should drive integration as fast as possible and as comprehensively as possible. Now, let me say, I think the core issue here, and the same issue was faced when it came to emptying the Victorian asylums and treating people with mental health problems in the community. The core issue is we have to fund both services to the same level until the transition is actually made. So we have to continue to fund acute services which is what the set-aside money uh, is about, the, the resources allocated there, and meantime, build up the resources which weren't there in the community, so that if we're going to empty the hospitals of these people who don't need to be there, we need to have the facilities in the community for that to happen. And we're trying to achieve that against a background of severe budget constraint, which was not one of our makings. Now, what they did, uh, with the asylum, the Victorian asylums was they provided bridge funding, which is the kind of equivalent of the set-aside money. But I think we can learn lessons from how it was done with mental health as to how it can be done with physical health in uh, how we achieve our objective here. But be under no misunderstanding. This is a complex issue, and it's one where we have made substantive progress, although there's still a lot of progress to be made. And with that, presiding officer, I will leave it there. It's a great pity these debates are being squeezed like this by the Bureau because it does no service to the Parliament, no service to the subject of social care, and no service to the next debate either. Move to the closing speeches. Brian Whittle, no more than four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm delighted to take part in this debate, and I thank Labour for bringing this to the Chamber. And I think it's been a really interesting debate this afternoon on a subject that, as, as Alex uh, has just said, could, as Alex Miller just said, could really have done with more time uh, to develop some of the main points. And I think the fact that there has been little attempt to leverage any political discourse probably highlights how important a subject this is. Now, Alex Lowley uh, started today's debate highlighting the, uh, the issues between NHS uh, and social care services are, are leading to that delayed discharge. Uh, Miles Briggs uh, developed that point, uh, suggesting that delayed discharge indicates the pressure that our current uh, uh, social services are, are in. And I think we have to highlight there is much within uh, the Scottish Government's outlined vision uh, and objectives that, that we would agree with. I think it's entirely right, for example, that 
we should aim for everyone to live that longer, healthier lives at home or in that homely setting. I mean, Alex Neil did focus on, on that, the, the fact that the treatment at home is both medically and, and from a financial perspective uh, a, a much better option. And it should receive uh, support from across, uh, across the House. Now, central to this vision, of course, is the development of the integrated uh, joint boards. And Alexander Stewart, uh, in his uh, speech, uh, highlighted the fact that initi initiating such a fundamental change will inevitably uh, come across bumps in the road. However, as the, as the Health and Sport Committee reported, uh, plans for the measure of so health and social care are being hampered by a lack of leadership, which was, was a thrust of Michelle Ballantyne's speech. I think there was certainly a sense there that the process, in that process, no one, no one governing body uh, is, is steering the ship and, and uh, Willie Rennie was, 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 was keen to develop that. And I think that's led to the point where the sort of 21 joint authorities are failing to deliver that tr transformation that is required. And, and this is after three years. So I think it was further backed up by the Nordic Audit Scotland report, which stated that the 2020 vision is progressing too slow. So uh, in, that, in that report, they also mentioned that financial sustainability of the health service in the medium to long term uh, 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 and recruiting the right number of skilled staff is key. Our main thrust of, of today's contributions, uh, today's contributions <coughs> and in the Labour motion has been in workforce planning or, or, or the lack thereof uh, initially. And now we have, we're looking for this cohesive strat strategy to alleviate the, the shortage of trained healthcare mm -hmm. professionals. I think some of the, the, SNP, the SNP policy at the top level, we're certainly able to support. I think the issue being that when you look below the surface, though, the more thought is required to create that sustainable uh, uh, and stable workforce. I think one of the examples I would uh, like to highlight is the unintended consequences of a lack of forethought and planning in presenting uh, the 1,140 hours of free childcare for three and four year olds. And the fact that, that, that carers are transferring from social care environment to the childcare environment, because it's the same kind of skill sets that are required in both settings. I did hear from nursery owners only a couple of weeks ago, they're recruiting more and more staff from the social care sector. And this has been raised again and again in the chamber. I think the government have been slow to react and recognize that all of these social care and health policies are interconnected and interdependent. So I think the integration of social care and health uh, is the way to go. And we support that drive to achieve this. However, the implementation of this policy has an issue with governance, according to the Health and Sport Committee investigation. At best, one would say, presiding officer, progress on delivery is patchy, depending on what part of the country you happen to come from. I'll leave it there, Deputy Presiding Officer. Jean Freeman, no more than four minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'll do my best to rattle through this. Um, we are undoubtedly faced with uh, challenges as we seek to properly deliver integrated health and social care. But Alec Neil is absolutely right. We should not set aside our recognition and our uh, credit for the significant achievements that have been made in many authorities and by those social care workers. It is right for people to point to delayed discharge. It is undoubtedly a challenge. But as Alexander Stewart said, we have integration authorities where there is no delayed discharge, where this is working, and his is not the only one. So it's not simply about resources, it's also about how we work, which is why I pointed earlier uh, when I spoke to the whole system thinking that is needed. Willie Rennie points to issues of governance and leadership. It wasn't alone. Uh, and without specific reference to the situation in Fife, which would not be appropriate, I think it is right now that the joint review, which I mentioned, led by COSLA and ourselves, is actively looking at issues of governance, finance, decision making. This approach is three years old. A lot has been achieved in those three years, but it is still young. I completely appreciate that if you are waiting for better services, it doesn't matter how young or old it is, you want those now. But I think that perspective is one that we should reasonably have and that it is a partnership. It's right that it is a partnership. It is an interesting proposition from Mr. Rowley to directly fund, no I shan't, to directly fund integrated joint boards. Presumably that is funding from both the health service and from local authorities. Now, I am happy to discuss that with COSLA and with changes to ensure our government procurement framework is applied in local authorities or is at least matched. 
But I would certainly welcome Mr Rowley and his colleagues' support uh, in doing that because I don't think those local authorities would take kindly to that idea where the employment of those that they currently employ is somehow lifted out and moved over. Jackie Bailey offered to help to ensure that the money that the government has provided to fully fund uh, the real living wage gets to the staff who deserve it. And I welcome that. So I'd ask her now, she can be Santa with me, work with me to make sure that all councils do precisely that. Not only uh, for those that they employ, but for those that they contract, including the third sector. And let's together look at lessons in those local authorities who directly employ social care staff where the terms and conditions, the career opportunities and the real living wage is such that they not only attract staff, but they retain them. Because in those authorities, no, I shan't, in those authorities where that is being done, what we see is that the clear guidance that 15-minute visits are only appropriate in certain circumstances, for example, medicine checks, are followed. And in those integration authorities, we see them moving away from time and task, moving away to focusing on the individual. The workforce is important. And indeed, I'm interested in Miles Briggs' uh, proposition for uh, a social care internship and happy to discuss that with them. But we cannot, as others have mentioned, talk about the importance of the workforce, the importance to uh, recruit and importantly retrain the, uh, retain them without recognizing we do that in the context of uh, Brexit. Brexit will take away a significant proportion of our current social care workforce. So what we need is not only free movement in order to continue to benefit from those skills and experience, but we also need changes to immigration policy that support the particular needs of Scotland. I commend the debate, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm happy to discuss this with others at any point, and I look forward to support for our amendment. Call on David Stewart to wind up the debate for no more than five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think this has been a, an excellent debate with well-informed and passionate contributions from across the chamber. Many members like Alec Rowley, Jackie Bailey and Alec Neil made powerful statements about the reality of social care by providing vivid examples of vulnerable constituents, many of whom relied on unpaid carers, the backbone of our social care network. I suspect that few members here today would disagree with the change in philosophy from hospital-based care to community-based health and social care. But the key issue is a health and social care system based on human rights, where people receive care based on need, not the ability to pay. But as we've heard in the debate so far, we have several key challenges. High levels of turnover in the social care sector, exacerbated by low pay, and the uncertainty of Brexit. By 2035, a quarter of Scotland's population will be aged 65 or over, up nearly a fifth from 2010. Just over a third of over 85-year-olds receive care at home or as a long-stay resident in a care home hospital. I'm really sorry, but I don't have enough time. However, older people are more likely than younger people, as we would expect, to be admitted to hospital in an emergency and of multiple and complex needs. But let us not forget today that 657,000 unpaid carers in Scotland, half of whom themselves are aged over 65. Technology and innovation are also crucial in my view. And the Health and Sport Committee, of which I'm a member, published an excellent report earlier this year. And as they say, and I quote, technology presents an opportunity to ensure innovation in health and social care flourishes and that Scotland is a leader and not left behind. Can I give you an example, sign officer, in my own region in Highlands and Islands, the Inverness City Regional Deal is developing a very imaginative project called Fit Homes. Now, these homes are future-proof for changes in the mobility of residents and of a series of sensors which collect data that can be monitored and responded to by agencies such as health and housing. Now, this model is designed to create a viable, lower-cost alternative uh, to full-time residential care and prolonged stays in hospital. And hopefully, this best practice will be picked up across Scotland. And of course, it's a truism to say that good homes support good health. 
I believe that this project could allow people to live independently in their communities for longer. Very much a point that Alec Neil made, I thought, in a very insightful contribution. And I'm delighted to say that Fit Homes won the Saltar Award and has been developed by Carbon Dynamic in conjunction uh, with Alban uh, Housing Society and NHS Scotland. Turning to the debate, and I'm afraid I'm very constrained in time, so apologies for those that I'm not able to mention. I thought Alec uh, Rowley made an excellent contribution in the treatment of social care workers, and he quoted Enable Scotland, which I in turn would like to quote, and they say that the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report in 2016, that 15% of the social care workforce are in in-work poverty. This means we have Scotland's most vulnerable people being cared for by Scotland's most vulnerable workforce. And he went on to talk about differential pay and conditions that are experienced uh, by care workers. And I would highlight to all members the excellent Unison study and survey into this area. I thought Miles Briggs made a, a very useful point uh, when he talked about delayed uh, discharge being a key factor. Uh, and he raised the issue that this problem is getting worse. And I too would endorse this contribution about social care internships as one factor in trying to reverse the problem um, of recruitment. Um, Alison Johnston, uh, I think, again, made a very useful point. I would particularly stress the point she made about the important role we have uh, in Scotland uh, and unpaid carers. And also, I think Willie Rennie's contribution about 500,000 bed days lost is a very in insightful uh, in indeed. Um, if I can just move to conclusion in the very brief time I've got left, um, uh, presiding officer. So my view is that social care is the very heart of our welfare state. It, of course, embodies the original beverage principles that create a system of welfare protection that looked after our vulnerable, our ill, our old and, a, and the sick. But we do need to have a significant shift in resources, as Alec Rowley has said, uh, in social care services, so we can achieve a sustainable financial model providing long-term stability for health and social care uh, in Scotland. And to conclude on time, um, as the famous American anthropologist uh, Margaret Mead once said, uh, never believe that a few caring people can't change the world, for indeed, that's all who ever have. Thank you. That concludes the debate on investing in social care for Scotland's future. Uh, it's time to move on to the next item of business. Can I ask people to change seats quickly, please? And use that time to tell you that we are already behind time uh, for the next scheduled debate. So it may well be that some speeches will have to be curtailed. <laughs>